Hello, and welcome to our 11th lecture on aerodynamics. Last time, we discussed the Kutta-Joukowsky theorem, a way to calculate the lift in an incompressible and inviscid flow with the circulation. We derived the relation through an example by exploring the rotating cylinder flow in more detail. This taught us that the rotating cylinder had the vortex elemental flow, which added circulation leading to lift. Today, we're going to bring the concept of elemental flows into the applied domain and explore panel methods. Panel methods are a way of discretizing arbitrary shapes and applying distributions of elemental flows over a quote-unquote surface to recreate streamline patterns that look like our boundary. Although any elemental flow type works, we will specifically explore source sheets for non-lifting bodies and vortex sheets for lifting bodies. These techniques are primarily computational, meaning we have to use numerical methods to solve the equations. So, let's jump in. Over the last few videos, elemental flows have taken a front seat, and for good reason we can build some interesting flow fields that mimic flows over specific bodies using a combination of only a few building blocks. We covered the semi-infinite body, the ranking oval, the stationary cylinder, and the rotating cylinder, which got some special attention because of its lift characteristics. But, so many aerodynamic applications deal with a ton of different shapes. What if we want to develop a method for arbitrary shaped bodies? For the most part, the method we'll develop today will see applied to things like airfoils, but it could also be used on fuselages and many other aerodynamic bodies. And this brings us to panel methods. With the panel method, we discretize complex aerodynamic shapes into panels. On each panel, we place a mini elemental flow. By tuning the strength of each mini flow element, we can recreate the streamlines that represent the original aerodynamic shape, thus recreating the flow. Because of this discretization, this technique is primarily computational. Though it was developed back in the days of Prandtl, it didn't take off until computing power started to catch up to our analysis techniques. So what do we mean by discretization? First, consider an airfoil. Generally, the surface of the foil represents a continuous, smooth curve. For the panel methods, we divide this curve up into many small connected segments, or panels. The ends of the segments are called boundary points, and the center of the segments are called control points. Each segment gets a number that rises sequentially as you count the panels around the curve. It's important to keep in mind here that, for this type of analysis, the surface of the foil doesn't actually exist, and the panels do not represent solid surfaces. The panels are places where we place elemental flows. For example, by placing a series of sources and sinks on the panels, with strength lambda, we develop the source panel method. If we have a series of point vortices with strength gamma, we get the vortex panel method. Very simply speaking, we are building a flow from the elemental components, just like in previous videos. There are just a lot more of those elements in a weird shape. So we add a uniform flow, which represents the body's translation, to a sum of elemental flows on the panels, and the result is a streamline pattern where one key streamline represents the shape of the body we're interested in. Once you have that, you have the flow around that body. Let's start first with the source panel method. This is a method that recreates the shape of a body using a source sheet, or a series of closely spaced sources and sinks. It's important to note here that although the source gets the recognition in the name, technically a sink could also be used here because the sink is the same as the source but with a negative strength. Also keep in mind that the source panel method is purely for non-lifting bodies. There is no addition of circulation through these flow elements, therefore no lift. Unfortunately, this limits us to primarily symmetric bodies with no angle of attack, 
and the use is rather limited while the concepts are valuable. With all that said, let's derive the equations for the flow from what we know about elemental flows. Consider a source sheet along a curve. The curve S starts at point A and ends at point B. The sheet strength is depicted as lowercase lambda, which is a function of the curve location S. Don't let the lowercase lambda throw you off. You might remember that the strength parameter of a single source is capital lambda, which represents the volumetric flow rate per unit depth into the page. However, since we're now dealing with a series of elements along a curve, we consider the strength in segments along that curve. Therefore, the strength along the curve is lowercase lambda, which is the volumetric flow rate per unit depth and per unit length s. On our diagram, consider a point in space called P. We're interested in how a segment of the curve, ds, acts on point P. The distance between the segment and the point is r. Recalling what we know about the elemental flows, the velocity potential at point P due to segment ds is as follows. This is just how a single segment impacts point P but there are many segments along our curve S. So we take the impact of each segment and add them up with integration. We integrate the segments from the start to the end of the curve. This lambda value, the sheet strength, as a function of the point on the curve, is the variable we're after. If we get lambda right, then the streamlined field accurately reflects the body shape we're interested in. If we get it wrong, the streamline field is wrong. So, we need to develop equations where we solve for the sheet strength distribution such that the streamlines represent the body. To accomplish this, and to work with a closed surface like an airfoil, we need to discretize our sheet into panels. Consider our huge airfoil again. There is an incoming flow that, for the sake of completeness, can have an angle of attack alpha. The x-coordinate is aligned with the chord, y is vertical, and the curve s follows the surface of the body. Let's divide the body up into panels, or segments, first marking the boundary points. Then, the boundary points are connected by panels, each centering around a red control point. These panels are numbered from 1 to n. Here, we can identify panels using either j or i, because in our analysis we will need to identify two separate panels at the same time. More on that later. The strength of the sources is also discretized. For example, the constant strength of the j panel source is called lambda sub j. Each panel has a constant lambda, and these are what we want to eventually solve for. As before, consider an arbitrary point P in space. The distance between the J panel and point P is R sub PJ, which has an angle coordinate theta. Considering point P, the potential at P from the J panel alone is the integral of the source strength over 2 pi ln R. In this case, the strength parameter is constant across this segment. So it comes outside of the integral, which is integrating across a single segment. This represents how the single J panel impacts point P. So let's consider all the panels. The potential phi at point P from all of the panels is the sum of the potential contribution from each panel individually. With the summation, we've added up all the panels. This equation successfully defines velocity potential throughout the entire flow field because we can put P anywhere we want. However, it is not solvable because we still have the unknown lambda strengths. But what if instead of considering all the points everywhere, we only considered the surface of our object? In other words, we consider how all the J panels impact all the I panels. 
The eye panel is surrounded by a bunch of other panels, and this eye panel feels the potential from all of those surrounding panels. The potential phi on the eye panel, due to all the other panels, is similar to above, though we've just replaced the distance with r sub ij, which represents the distance between the eye panel and the j panel. A perfectly reasonable question might be, why did we restrict ourselves to only considering the surface, and how did we know to do that? As with most fluid mechanics problems, the surface represents a key location in our flow, specifically because we tend to have well-defined boundary conditions at the surface. At the boundary, we have to enforce the condition that flow cannot go through it or penetrate it. This means that velocity normal to the wall at the wall is zero. Okay, now that we know this, let's sketch our diagram again. A thick airfoil in a free stream divided into panels. Consider the eye panel. The normal velocity on the eye panel has two specific contributions. First, there is a contribution from the free stream flow, because a portion of that flow is normal to the surface. The angle between the free stream and the eye panel is beta, so the free stream component is u infinity cosine beta. The second contribution comes from the surrounding forces. You can imagine, if you were surrounded by a bunch of openings blowing out air, some of that might contribute to a normal velocity at your location. The normal velocity at the I panel, which is the n sub i direction, is the partial derivative of the local potential with respect to n. Recall that the definition of the velocity potential is the spatial derivative of the potential equals the corresponding velocity component. So u equals d phi dx, and v equals d phi dy. So here, we want the velocity in the n direction. We take the derivative of phi with respect to n. Our two contributions to the normal velocity, the free stream and the surrounding panels, get added together and set equal to zero because of our surface boundary condition. Our first term in the equation represents the contribution from the sources, and our second term represents the free stream contribution. We have a math nuance here that needs to be taken care of. You might notice that we have the natural log of r in our integral. However, if i equals j, meaning we look at the same panel and its impact on itself, the radial distance separating them is zero because they're the same panel. This poses a problem because the natural log of zero is undefined and the problem gets even worse if we try to take that derivative. To fix this, we set a rule that says we cannot evaluate this term when j equals i, and then we add another term out front which accounts for this contribution that was found mathematically. I like to think of this first term as a correction for us limiting our summation. And this equation is the main equation for the source panel method. It is analytically solvable, meaning we don't need to employ any fancy numerical techniques if we don't want to. There are n unknowns represented by the lambdas and the subscript j, which represents the surrounding panels of a panel we're interested in, and n equations represented by the subscript i. This means each panel we inspect gets its own equation. With the appropriate strength parameters, we can sum our uniform elementary flow with the series of sources to recreate a streamlined field that represents a non-lifting body. So, we're still using the same elemental flow concepts, just in a lot more complex way. Next, we're going to use the same analysis, but on the vortex elemental flow in the vortex panel method. This is where we consider a vortex sheet on a curve. This method does work for lifting bodies because the vortices add circulation. This makes it a much more widely used and versatile technique. The steps here will mirror what we just went through with the source sheet so we can move a bit more quickly. Consider a vortex sheet on a curve S that starts at A and ends at B. 
the sheet has a strength lowercase gamma as a function of the s-coordinate. Recall that the strength for a point vortex is capital gamma, which represents the circulation of the point vortex. Here, we're considering a sheet of vortices, so the strength parameter is lowercase gamma, which is the total circulation per unit length s. Consider an arbitrary point P in space that is distance r from segment ds, also marking the azimuthal distance theta. The velocity potential phi at this arbitrary point P, due to this one segment ds, is d phi equal to the vortex strength over 2 pi times the angle. Note here that lowercase gamma times ds represents the total circulation of that segment. It might help to recall the potential flow for a vortex, which was gamma over 2 pi theta, which we've used here but with our sheet segment consideration. Now we add up the contributions from all of the segments on the curve acting on point P to find the velocity potential surrounding our curve. An interesting thing to point out here is that we have the integral of gamma ds. This integral represents the total circulation integrated along an arbitrary curve between points A and B. As before with the source sheet, we will now discretize our sheet into panels and consider a closed lifting body, like a cambered airfoil. This airfoil has incoming velocity, u infinity, at an angle of attack alpha. We divide the shape into panels with boundary points and control points. Each panel gets a number, with j and i representing two distinct panels. The total number of panels is n. Right away, we're going to limit ourselves to the surface, so we consider the potential phi on the i panel due to the j panel, which is delta phi sub j. Sum up all the panel's contributions to the velocity potential on the i panel to get the total potential at that panel. Note here that the strength parameter gamma is constant for each panel, so it is allowed to come out of the integral which only integrates across a single J panel. Since we're considering only the surface again, we get to apply our boundary condition that the normal velocity at the surface must equal zero, or the no penetration condition. There are multiple contributors to the normal velocity at any given point on the surface. First, we have the contribution due to the free stream velocity, which is again u infinity times cosine beta, where beta is the angle between the free stream and the local surface. Second, we are on a panel surrounded by tons of tiny little vortices, and these vortices produce a velocity field at our position. To get this velocity, we take the spatial derivative of the local velocity potential in the direction normal to the surface. Once we have that all worked out, to enforce our boundary condition, we sum the two contributions and set them equal to zero. Like we had for the source panel method, this represents a set of n equations defined by the subscript j and n unknowns defined by i. Gamma, the strength parameter, is what we need to solve for. This equation represents the primary equation for the vortex panel method. Say we have an airfoil. We now know how to sum a uniform flow and a series of particular point vortices to create a streamline field that accurately represents the original body. Finding the correct gamma distribution is what allows us to recreate the flow field successfully, where streamlines equal bodies. This method works for lifting bodies, so naturally we want to calculate the lift. We mentioned earlier, the total circulation comes from integrating the lowercase gamma distribution along the surface. Through the Kutta-Joukowsky theorem, this circulation can get us our lift. 
You might recall from the rotating cylinder analysis that the circulation parameter can influence the stagnation points on the body, pushing them around the surface. We have to consider this here, because the stagnation points are not naturally fixed. First, let's consider a non-lifting body streamline field. The stagnation points naturally occur at the leading and trailing edge of the body, or the front and the back, so we have nothing to worry about. However, once we start to consider lifting bodies, things get a bit more complicated. There is nothing that fixes the stagnation points. In this first case, the stagnation points can unphysically reside on the bottom and top surfaces of the foil. This would result in the flow rapidly curving around the trailing edge, back upstream, which is not what happens in real life. Compare this to the realistic case, where the stagnation point is near the leading edge and at the trailing edge exactly. So, depending on our gamma distribution, the stagnation points can move. To fix this, we separately enforce what is called the cutta condition, which forces the back stagnation point to be on the trailing edge, or the point at the end of the foil. In summary, we have developed two separate ways to analyze the flow and forces around both non-lifting and lifting aerodynamic bodies. These were called the panel methods, specifically the source panel method and the vortex panel method. The source panel method uses a series of sources to represent symmetric or non-lifting aerodynamic bodies. Similarly, the vortex panel method uses a series of vortices to represent the cambered and angled aerodynamic bodies that produce lift. The major pro of the source panel method is that the, it is analytically solvable. However, it only works for non-lifting bodies, which severely limits its use. The vortex panel method is not analytically solvable. The requirement to enforce the cutta condition on the trailing edge over-constrains our system and leads to many issues. However, when solved numerically, it does work for lifting bodies and has a wide capability. It's important to point out that although the source and vortex panel methods get all the glory in the books and derivations, technically you can deploy any of the elemental flows on a sheet and get a different kind of panel method. This includes the series of sources and sinks, a series of doublets, and a series of vortices. Let's wrap things up with a practical note. You will most likely make use of panel methods in aerodynamic concept design. We indicated at the beginning that this is primarily a numerical technique, and computers make fast and easy work with these panel methods. This means it is valuable first approximation for body and shape design. Once you're close to the shape that gets you the behavior you want, you use a more sophisticated flow solver to get the more accurate results. Additionally, it's useful in two-dimensional and three-dimensional bodies. For example, the Panair panel method code developed in the 1970s by Boeing was a critical instrument in the design of the 737 which is the most distributed airplane ever. And that's it. Let's review. We started by seeking a method that predicts the flow and forces over arbitrary shaped bodies. This led us to panel methods, which discretize shapes into a series of panels that house elemental flows. For non-lifting bodies, the source sheet can be used to recreate the flow field. The final equation that solves for the source distribution strength stemmed from the no penetration boundary condition, which was completely analytically solvable. For lifting bodies, the vortex sheet can be used. Once again, we use the no penetration condition to define our final equation, though this one was not analytically solvable because we have the addition of the cutta condition to enforce at the trailing edge, which over constrains our system. And we ended by exploring how we're most likely to come across these methods in concept design of aircraft. I hope you liked the video, and thanks for watching.